Hello, welcome. This is Charlene Campbell with Call on the Midwife and today's my day to share. So I want to continue with my list. This is from my manual and um, I've mentioned about it before. You can get it at themidwiferytoday.com um, and we've gone through these top um, eight items so far. So we have just a few more to get to 12. I think we'll get them all done today. And as I was pondering about what would be the most helpful thing I could share today, um, it's a beautiful day today and I've been out this morning picking um, in my yard. We have a seven acre piece in Salem, Idaho, and um, we have a lot of natural fauna and flora on our own land. I collect a lot of my own mullein I have a lot of big, huge mullein stalks that are on my land still. I'm just kind of saving those for the fall when um, we've actually set the date. So I'll update you on the um, the out of hospital unexpected childbirth herbal response kit that Zoe Bartholomew will be teaching. Um, that will be on the 30th of September here in Salem and um, It'll be, all the details are below. I'll put the Facebook link to the event below so you can go in there and you have to pre-register for that if you want to come. But anyways, I'm saving those so we can collect them <laughs> for part of our... But I've been out and I've been collecting sage today out of my yard, okay? So I just want to say a little bit about sage. Um, and then after I teach you the midwifery, I'm going to show you how to make sage sticks and I'm going to show you how to properly burn the sage so that it's a antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal for um, your not only uh, topically, you know, if used topically or whatever, but also the main re reason I'm sharing this is that you can burn the sage and it literally clears the air, clears out the um, spores of the bio um, toxins that are being, you know, spread via uh, the airborne type. Okay, which is COVID basically when people are coughing. Um, and you could have like people in your house that are actually sick and you could be staying in the house, but maybe you'd have um, a, a plan of doing, you burn the sage every so often to keep it clear. Okay, that's just one way that we can use the natural flora and fauna that's everywhere this is literally everywhere this is probably the most common herbal plant i see around um here in uh in this area and it's all i mean everywhere i've ever lived really if there's different there's all different ones and you could use almost any one but anyway i'll get into more about the sage after we're gonna do the the work part first for me because that's my fun part is teaching about the herbs but I also feel like this is really important okay so <clears throat> we the last thing we talked about was when the cord is wrapped around the neck and um, that's kind of a thing that people have a lot of fear around so I suggest if you haven't watched my other two videos that you go watch them the previous one and one quite a bit farther back that had like 23k views or whatever and it really goes through in detail too on what to do when the cords around the neck okay um, because for years they were cutting the cords on the neck and basically you're doing a bloodletting when you're doing that the baby's going to get anemia there's going to be marginal brain defects there's all kinds of research to prove it so now don't cut the cord on the neck anymore um, and establishing calm clear phone communication with emergency medical services so if you are in a position where you can actually get help and you have a situation where you do know that you need help then you know call give them the information to, uh, find out from the woman how many weeks pregnant is she um, what her symptoms are if her water's broken or not um, how many how her contractions are I mean you could find out not too many details because you're going to be calling them pretty quick right um, but just basic details and then how you communicate with them making sure that you have um, a light on if it's dark and you know they're coming make sure the lights on if this goes for like a student midwife helping a midwife at a home birth these these 
basically go for home birth or unexpected birth response. Everything I'm teaching is both. You know what I mean? So uh, mostly some things you wouldn't have access to if you were not with a midwife. It would just be you only have your hands and we suggest not to go inside the vagina at all with your hands. Um, but you know, midwives would normally be doing that. And so that I might cover more information on certain things about going inside. But for the out of hospital situation, if you're being um, asked to respond and it's not your, it's not your uh, job description normally to be a midwife, then, you know, even if you're a nurse or a doctor that works in the hospital, these tools will be really helpful for you because um, responding to birth outside of the hospital is a whole different ball game to responding in the hospital and it you can you can get away with all kinds of stuff in the hospital and you know they can fix it with drugs and interventions and surgeries and all kinds of different things that they have in there but in a home setting especially if you don't have access um, for one reason or another or it could be that the hospitals are loaded like i talked about with a real pandemic that's not 99 percent you know, people actually get better when they get it, um, which is the one we have right now. So I think what we're going to see is a lot more um, in the future where there's going to be more serious, serious things going on that cause um, the hospitals to be less of a place where you want to be. Um, when you have a baby, because babies are super vulnerable to bacterial infections and they can die very shortly after they get them. So you don't want to be... Um, exposing a baby to anything that they don't need to be exposed to unless there's um, a really high risk that the mother needs to be in the hospital for some other purpose which you know that can be you know a decision that parents have to make but I think a lot of parents through this even with how low the infection rate was for adults they were they were choosing out of hospital birth that was my experience with a lot of the people I was talking to in Seattle that people were making changes in during their pregnancy, sometimes lots of times in their last trimester of pregnancy, partly because they could, couldn't bring their whole team in, they couldn't bring their whole doula team in. And so that just messed with their birth plans more than they wanted to be. So like a, a lot of my friends who live in Seattle and here and all over are really busy. And I think it's just gonna get more and more that way. And so I think there will be times where they're going to need helpers if if it becomes a crisis situation, you know what I mean, which I think it could. So anyway, better be prepared beforehand than wait till we have a crisis on our hands and then start collecting family cloth and learning these important principles of self-reliance where it comes to childbearing. I feel like it's really imperative. Even if you have nobody childbearing in your family, you, it's it's a good idea right now to co collect a sustainable reusable birthing kit and family cloth kit for yourself a family cloth kit everybody's going to need but a birthing kit you know and then also to learn these principles so that you can be of service to someone in need in times of had which are going to be very uncertain times of tribulations we know they're prophesied in the bible we can tell this is what's happening i mean anybody with eyes to see can see <laughs> I hope you have eyes to see and if you don't open them because it's time anyway um, so clear calm communication with EMS and making sure that you report the signs and symptoms how many weeks pregnant she is if her water's intact different things like that just to give them some information if it's her first baby or not um, but most of the time in what we teaching what we're teaching for you don't actually have time to call or there isn't anyone available or something like that. that's kind of the situations that we're teaching for and so but you still need to know how to call that and always use that option if you have it because you know um, if, if there, especially if there's something unusual that's going on with her or she's premature or something like that and remember if a mother is premature and you have no choice about it just remember that kangaroo care was done for thousands of years and babies lived and they still do. And in countries like New Zealand and Australia, where kangaroo care is mandatory in those neonatal units, because they know they know that it's um, going to save lives to keep the baby skin to skin. And um, so, yes, we need to get back to that. 
And so just always keep the baby skin to skin with, with um, dry clothes, cloth on the outside so that the baby is literally imprinting with the mother's nervous system and the baby's um, breath respirations will um, pattern with the mother's and the baby will start breathing really, really prop, you know, in a good rhythm for the baby. And, the, but babies have a naturally arrhythmic type of breathing anyway. So just remember that if you're ever listening to a baby breathe, they can stop breathing for a couple seconds and then they'll <laughs> breathe really rapidly. And then they'll take a couple of really deep breaths. So just know that's normal for a baby to have irregular rhythm with breaths. But the, um, the skin to skin will improve whatever's happening with the respirations. If the baby's having tachypnea, so really high respiration rate, because usually it's because the baby's breathing shallowly in the upper lung fields and not breathing deeply. And there's still fluid in the alveoli that's in the lower lung fields. And so that's why when I taught you how to listen, that's why we listen in the lower lung fields also to make sure that we don't hear a bunch of rattling of water in there and um, sort of rubbing of the, of the alveoli because they're so sticky and they're not really opening up like they need to. So my baby needs to take a nice deep breath. And that's why stimulation can help. That's why um, the when you give the rescue breaths, you want to give five rescue breaths at once. Don't just give one. Always give five because then it gives the baby's lower lung fields a chance to fully expand and push out the fluids. Okay, well, we got off a little bit on a tangent. That's okay. <laughs> that seemed like an important thing to talk about. So here we go. Um, What's next? I think we've talked enough about that. So knowing the location of the fetal heart tones. This is the main one that we were going to do today. And listening with the fetoscope or Doppler. Okay. Let's talk about that for a minute. I've got my... Um, Boy, that sage is really strong. Like, see, I don't even really hardly need to burn it to get that when it's fresh like this. But I'll tell you something, just a little tip on this. If you don't make your, you know, if you don't make your sticks right away and wrap them real nice and tight and then put them to dry, and then once they're dry, you wrap them in tissue paper or put them inside something so they're not like shedding and you hold them delicately. Um, these will just start to all shed off, you know, and then you'll have the herb, but you won't have necessarily the ability to make the stick. So you want to make the stick when they're fresh. That's just a little tip. Now I'm just going to show you three methods of taking the fetal heart rate. We do not actually do this and we don't teach this in our classes because it's, we're teaching response, birth response. I've got to turn my fan back on just that suddenly kind of warm in here and I turned it off because it was making a ticking sound I'm like okay a little ticking sound is okay <laughs> I need some some fanning <laughs> okay there we go it's warm outside it is it is it's a warm day today it's it was so smoky the last couple days that the sun came up and it was literally like this big ball of red fire coming out of the sky. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen it quite that. I'm going to take a sip of my celery juice made by David. Mm. Good stuff. <laughs> Okie dokie. Now I'm showing you. There's different ways that you can take the fetal heart tones. Now I just want to mention one that is actually a viable way to do it if the mother's not doesn't have too much extra layers there you can use an empty toilet paper roll and put it on your ear and then have the mom's belly like I can actually it really even just doing this simplifies my how I can hear so yeah you put the toilet paper roll between you and the mom's belly and you listen and you have to go all around till you find it right most of the time it's best if you don't really know what you're doing. I think just don't worry about that because you don't want to cause any fear. Oh, I can't hear it because 
if you don't have a trained ear, <laughs> you may not hear it. That's all I can say. It's not the easiest thing in the world sometimes, especially with the, if the mom's baby is in a position where the baby is back is to the mother's um, back also, then the baby's going to be around like this. And when you try to get the heart rate, it's going to be tucked into her back. And so you might not hear it as well. Or you might be hearing the placenta. If you hear like a swoosh, 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 you hear like a pumping of, but it's swooshy sounding. That's the placenta or the cord. The heartbeat has a distinct tapping like it's a bump, 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 bump. You know, it's a thumping sound. It's a distinct tick tock. You know, you don't want to settle for a swooshy, soft sound because you need to keep moving around till you find a heart. Now, you still should be able to get the baby's heartbeat over top. If you get right over top of where the heart is, even if the baby's posterior, you still should be able to hear it, just not as strong. Especially if you're a student midwife, you're practicing. Excuse me, I need to cough. <coughs> you know, then you need to... I just need to put this is that is quite potent <laughs> i have to say it's like you're inhaling and i think it's clearing my lungs out right there just even having that that sage in the room is and i've had i've had some issues with my lungs so cool yeah okay so this is really one of my favorite little instruments um it's called a penard i really like it um i have i have a metal one and i have a smaller wooden one and I have this big long wood one same principle that I just taught you with the um, with the toilet paper roll the empty toilet paper roll oh yeah that really magnifies you put that right on your ear and you get mama's belly right here and oh then you just listen you be patient and you do it and you can tap it out if you're a student midwife you can tap it on the mom's arm or her if you write by her leg or wherever you think is comfortable for her, you can tap it out for her so she can feel, oh, that's the beat. You don't have to say nothing. And because you still have to listen, right? You tap it out lightly. And also the midwife can see that you're tapping it out if you're a student and she's wanting to observe. So she can hear you and you're, so you're tapping it out. And then, you know, you could have your watch and count it too for six seconds, for 15 seconds, for one full minute. Really, ideally, for a full minute, you want to count. And sometimes for two to three minutes, depending on... It's good to actually count through, especially when you're first initiating the um, intake. Or you, This is if you're a student midwife, you're working with a midwife for a home birth setting. You would um, take a full, you know, three or four minute heartbeat before, during, and after a contraction. So you could see what the baby's doing during the contraction before the contraction and after the contraction and then you write it out as a kind of a dialogue this is what was happening before this was happening during this what's happening after so we can see how baby's responding to a contraction and you know d cells are when you when you have d cells at the end and they don't come back up really quickly and then you're still getting them after that's when you have issues that d cells is below normal range so the baby's heartbeat in utero will be somewhere between technically 120, but it can go down to 110, 100, 100 during sometimes when the baby's being really compressed during the second stage of labor and the baby's being pushed out. The heartbeat can go down even to 90, but then if it pops right back up again after and everything's normal and mom's doing good and baby's heartbeat's just doing fine, it's more like that baby has actually good um, response. It's responding to stimulation and then it's easily, res uh, quickly returning back to normalcy. It's not staying in sluggish places like boo boom, boo boom, boo boom. Those are not good heartbeat. Okay, so I've showed you two ways. Now another way, and I, I, I have used all of these ways in pregnancy and in labor. Okay. For many, many years since I was more highly regulated in Seattle and such, um, and in British Columbia with the midwives there, 
we used the Doppler during labor for the most part um, when we were taking heart tones. So that's a sound, you know, it has sound weight radiation. Um, but before that, like I said, for 15 years, we practiced where we used, we would use a something like this, similar to this, a little bit different, but very, very similar. This is a Dealey series 10, or not Dealey, um, uh, an Allen series 10, sorry. Dealey is something you suction the ba baby's mouth with. But yeah, this is a, a fetal heart um, stethoscope. So you have these pointing to your ears, like we talked about that. For stethoscope, same principle with this. This actually is for your head so that you're because this is a conductor right here, so you don't want to be touching that if possible. Some people just hold this, and sometimes, depending where I'm at, I'll just do that too. Oops, just wiped myself. You know, to hold this like this, where you want it. Or if you don't want anything on it and you really want to feel well, sometimes you can actually feel it on your head too. You can feel the pounding, the, the thumping. And so you just want to get that really smooth on the mom's belly. Um, usually where you're going to get the heart rate is in the lower right or left quadrant or directly in the center between the belly button and the woman's mons pubis or pubic bone. You'll never get it lower than the pubic bone because there's a bone there. So it has to be above the pubic bone and oftentimes it'll be on the side that the baby's on. So the baby's back will be to the mother's front and say if the baby's on the left side, typical sit very typical position, um, left occipital anterior with LOA as the position and the baby's um, back will be to the mother's left front. And so you'll find it in the lower left quadrant of the mother's belly. And you know, you'll have to just keep moving. Now, I've brought the other, um, most, this isn't my, the highest end sonogram or, um, um, Doppler, but I thought I'd just bring a really cheap, you know, a really inexpensive one so that if people really do, like, you can buy these for like 50 bucks or something. They're cheaper than 50. They're cheap. Um, and of course, as a practicing midwife, I've had the higher end ones, which were like $800 or $1,000, and they're really expensive, <laughs> but they do work better. But these things still work. And there are some midwives who actually use these cheaper ones. Um, I sometimes would have these, you know, a lot, have the student using this one um, for practicing and things like that. So, but anyway, this is a Doppler, okay? And you just turn it on and you just apply it. to hear it but see these aren't as good 80 beats per minute okay these aren't as good as um it reads on here as well but it's nice but you really should be able to hear it. you shouldn't go only by the reading on any doppler that's just my opinion the, the reading is only a secondary confirmation never the first the first is always your own counting your own listening and not going by what this thing says because it can double it it can make mistakes and um, yeah, so that's that. Now, just a reminder is that you have to have some kind of lube between your Doppler and the person, which that's probably why it didn't work. Let's try it again. Okay, let's do this again, man. Let's see if it helps. Also, technically we should do it under my left breast, so I'm gonna do that. You don't have to necessarily see it, but let's see if we can do it, okay? Get this going. Okay, let's hear it there. Take it off. See how it makes a big noise? 
So I'm going to turn it off, turn it way down, turn off. Then I'm going to take it off. Okay, it's got the gel on it. Now it's going to be, I've got a nice hanky here. It's going to be all yucky. I'm going to wipe that off. So that's what you're going to do with the mom. You're going to wipe her off. You're not going to leave a bunch of gobs on there. And you're also going to take a separate cloth there and wipe this off too so that it's nice and clean for the next time you want to use it. Sometimes at births, actually, we just, for the students here, you know, we just leave the gobs on and we just, if we're using on the same mom, you know, over and over, then we'll put it on a nice clean tissue in a bowl or on a tray. And that way we can keep putting it back. And I like a metal bowl, personally. That's my favorite. Okay. Um, I have to mention here that some women do not want, and I'm I'm reading it on my... Um, my midwifery websites I'm on quite a few that a lot of women are coming and saying I don't want any ultrasounds and I don't want a Doppler at my birth because I don't want that sound radiation on my baby there is studies you know there's some studies that aren't that great but of course most of them are covered up <laughs> um, you know it is it's it's there's risks to things when it comes to an unborn baby um, but so so you know the midwives have a lot of them have a hard time with it. Um, I can see the point. I've, I've actually done my own births without the Doppler on purpose. I did all mine at home without the Doppler. Um, that was after having one at, in the hospital and one cesarean, and then I had three VBACs after that. And yeah, that really got me into midwifery because I realized that women needed an advocate. So I became an advocate for others because of my experience and helped a lot of people have successful victorious VBAC births in Canada and the States. That's been good. All right. Um, even in Jamaica, I actually helped the VBAC mom there too, which is really cool. Okay. So counting, um, counting the heartbeat. So when you're counting the heartbeat, um, you want to, the mother's heart rate should be, or the baby's heartbeat, inside the fetal heart rate should be somewhere between 120 to 160 beats per minute if it's over 160 beats per minute and you've taken it and you're like oh wow it's like 170 or 165 or 180 or whatever then that means the baby is either some some things that it can be it can be infection but it also could mean maybe the mom's in the tub Maybe she's been throwing up or maybe she hasn't been drinking enough and she got she started sweating. Get her out of the tub. Um, get her get her cooled off. Get her drinking. And then take it again in, you know, a few minutes. So do a change. Make a change. Um, babies get their heartbeat goes up when they get dehydrated. And when the mother's not drinking enough or she's hot and sweating and perspiring, the baby's going to be. So don't have the baby too hot and keep the baby out of the tub at that point. If they're in the tub, sometimes moms will be doing water births and stuff. Now I'm trying to make this for both emergency response and just regular students who are studying so that they can learn best how to help at a home birth with a, with a midwife. Um, and so I think just learning how to count, normally you'd count for one minute. And you can actually do a six second count and times it by 10 and that's really easy. So like say you count and for six seconds you get, um, say you get 12, right? 12 times 10 is 120. So then you know that's what it is. But technically you should actually listen for a full minute or more to the heartbeat to get a full because there could be like irregular rhythms and it, you, you want to get an idea of what the sort of overall idea of what the heart rate is. Okay, that's just a little bit about taking fetal heart tones for you. And let's go on to the next one. Number 11 is charting as accurately and in as much detail as possible. Okay, well, if you're at a, a natural birth response and you're just doing your best, I don't think you need to worry about that. If you are a student midwife or um, someone that's trying to learn to be in the birth field or you want to be a lot more helpful in the times to come, we probably will have some charting going on. 
some of the things to remember is um, to you can retake something if you're not sure or always get the midwife's opinion if you're not sure um, don't write something down if you're really unsure I think get get either be confident that yes I already know this is the right thing and I've been instructed I'm at that level now I know exactly what I'm doing but if you don't and you need help don't be afraid to ask for help that's a big thing as a budding midwife or someone who wants to be helpful in the days to come I think and you're preparing for that is always be honest don't be afraid that you don't know something because it's okay if you don't know um, and then with charting one of the, you know a really important thing is to note the when the head is born that's just a, when the water breaks um, when the head is born um, when she starts actively pushing on her own without being coached to push we don't recommend that at all it's very counterproductive to be coached um, unless the mother is a first-time mom and she just can't figure it out then she might need some support but not counting or you know cheering or anything like that mm -mm. <laughs> just support in a really healthy um, quality communication that's not too intense just really really um, empowering for the mom to find her own place of pushing because her body will do most of that if she just relaxes and lets it happen and trusts her body so it's not about her doing anything really special to make it happen um, that puts a lot of pressure on the mother too and it also creates a lot of tension if you have tension in the throat you have tension in the vulva area as well they're both connected so get her to relax her throat and moan or you know uh, sighing can be good relaxing the throat is really help okay so where are we we're going back to um, the charting um, I think the charting should be the when the head is born that way if you get a shoulder stuck you're not gonna be like wondering you know how long has it been because you you can't always re you can't rely on your own judgment of time in emergencies your time judgment can get really worked in an emergency I promise you so having um, you know the idea that you are gonna note the time of the birth of the head and jot it down is not a bad idea and then if, especially if you have two people there one person can do that and then you can call out you know how much time has gone by okay one minute's gone by two minutes has gone by then you can start doing more and more things um, that are more than what you've been doing or you keep repeating the same cycle and usually that'll help um, prayer of course I do recommend highly because you know you get guided by the angels that are there we our course is called the errand of angels course for a reason and that's because I believe in angels and I've experienced them help me multiple times and I've heard so many stories I could never deny it so just remember you have help there and you can ask for any time so that's a little bit about the charting um, I think also just just to get back to that is writing down um, when the baby's actually born so from the time that the head is fully out to the neck to the time the baby's born and then um, well in this case of shoulders associate might be like up here because that sometimes happens where it looks like the chin is kind of stuck and then um, it still starts then though that timing and then you'd of course be noting the time that the placenta came out and also if she was bleeding on more than usual or how much did she bleed um, one day I really want to do a class on that where we investigate how to assess blood loss and we're gonna do that one day but right now we're working on the the herbal class and that's gonna be really fun I'm very excited about it um, we're actually gonna be having all the items in the afternoon so people can go home with their kids too that'll be really cool um, so we're looking forward to that and um, let's see what's next assessing vitals okay so just knowing how to do blood pressure I think it's a really good thing to know how to do and anybody can learn how to take blood pressure it's so you know it just takes a lot of practice and practicing on a bunch of people 
and writing it down, practicing taking it and writing it down. Um, there's, I have films on that at Midwifery Today too that go into all those basic things about vital signs and how to take them, how to take a person's temperature, how to take their pulse, how to take their blood pressure, and how to listen to fetal heart tones. Those are things you could actually practice on other people if you wanted to learn them, um, if, if they're your family members and they'll let you, <laughs> or your really good friend and <laughs> they consent. So um, just, you know, practicing is really important. Okay, that's that for the um, information about birth. Now I'm going to show you how to make this little these are quite small, like I picked them small because they're this is the way they are on the plant right now. Um, but I just want to show you that this is made out of the same plant, but it's a lot longer and these are a lot bigger. So it just depends on what you um, have. And see, I'm going to show you how I wrap it. This one's wrapped with a bit of a heavier hemp. Uh, I personally like hemp the best, um, but you can you could get just some string of some kind to wrap them. Okay, you can use um, you can use um, embroidery floss is nice. I don't have that, but I mean, I think that's a nice thing to use as embroidery floss as well. Okay, so here we are. We've got our sage, and I'm gonna because this is such a powerful um, antibacterial um, plant, and it's free. I mean. And it's really good for getting labor going too. I use the oil mixed with olive oil and I mix it into a little container. Um, I just had somebody share that we went on a hike and then her baby flipped. But part of that was, uh, this was a story from years ago, seven years ago, where um, she came to my office, the baby was breech. I took her on a hike in the Issaquah Mountains and when we came back, the baby had flipped into head first it was really cool but before we went i did a long massage and spoke to the baby with sage and olive oil on her belly okay in a darkened room that was really really intimate and then we went for the walk okay and we planned it because her baby had turned to breach okay and it worked it did <laughs> but i i didn't say that on the facebook post but i wanted to add that now that actually there was more to it than just the walk <laughs> and we prayed that the baby would turn and we talked to the baby and we asked the baby to turn and we also told the baby that the baby was safe because there was some things happening a little bit of you know contentious stuff in the marriage that was difficult for both mama and papa and so and the baby was picking up on that okay so I've got my string um, I'm going to try to show you guys this. Let me see now. Let me see how I'm going to show you this. I'm just going to have to hold it like this, I guess. Okay, so here we go. We've got our, our, all our, I like to line them all up as much as I can and try to keep them relatively the same size, you know. This is going to be a really thick one. Like I would normally make it thinner, but I just feel like, yes, I want to make this one really thick. It's going to be a really good one. Maybe we'll use it at the sweat lodge or something. I'm gonna do it the day after our class here. Okay, so I've wound this up to the top. Now I'm winding it back down. My other one's down here. I'm gonna actually bring this one down first and then I'll bring the other down. Sorry. I'm just basically winding. I'm winding. I'm doing it as tight as I can. Um, I wanna make it really compact so it's like a stick. I've got two big um, pieces of this um, thin hemp. And so then I'm gonna go this way, now down this way, opposite direction. See how I made like little crossovers, right? Oh man, this is good. It smells amazing. You can't even believe how good it smells. It is so pungently good in a good way. Um, and of course, this is good for all the feminine things. It's healing the uterus, um, healing the, the, the mother, you know, the mothering parts of us, okay? So here we go. I'm going to tie this. I'm just going to tie it at the bottom. Sometimes I'll tie, like, I've tied it here 
and now I'm tying it here so that it doesn't fall apart when I burn it halfway. I like to tie it in a few different spots. <laughs> it's kind of protected from from sort of falling apart because I, I might burn once it's completely dry so it's ready now I've kind of just formed it. Um, it's, I mean, it's not completely dry, but it's completely encased in here and it's nice and hard. And then it will sit now for a couple of weeks, probably a few weeks until it's nice and dry. And then I'll wrap it in my um, tissue paper and put it inside another bag, or a cloth bag or something. Okay, for now I'm going to put it down here. Now, how do you use them? Okay, <laughs> kind of important how to use them. Um, well, I, I think being safe is really important because if you're going to have fire and matches and things like that, you really need to know what you're doing. And, um, so the best thing I have found is to have a good quality metal pan of some kind. I just like pie pans are good, really good, but you can use whatever you want. And then um, I'm actually going to take a little one. These are really little ones I made. Okay, it's just a little one. It's dry, perfectly dry. I'll show you how I burn it. So I've got the pan underneath in case anything flies or in case, you know, um, the ashes drop or anything like that. I've got the pan. I can always put it out if I need to because the pan, I can butt it out in the pan. I like to get the end good and burning. And I'm still start to smell it. I can start to smell it. Hmm. It's a good feeling. I think it's very spiritual, personally, to light things like this. You can sage your own body, so that's a, that's a really good way to do it too. And then you can just take your pan, you can walk around the room, you can use, um, you know, you could use a fan or, <clears throat> let me just show you, Oops. there goes my, my um, little, what is it, not my, my Doppler, my um, pinard. If you watch Call on the Midwife, You'll see that the pinards is what they use. They really do. So you can use the fan to just kind of move the smoke around into the corners and all around the room, the windows, the doors. You can do yourself. You can do your whole body down by your legs. You know, your back. You can have somebody do your back. So anyway, it's really nice. It's very, very pleasant smell. Okay, so that's how to use it. And last but not least, I had this very strong feeling that I wanted to sing because a lot of my circles, well, all of the circles that we do, we sing. Why do we sing? It's so new for so many people in, in these really conservative um, Christian communities that I work with a lot, um, is that they are used to a lot of talking and not a lot of singing and not a lot of really enjoyment in circle time. Uh, because they've been basically in these patriarchal, misogynistic systems where there's people standing up in front of them talking to them all the time and they're just passively receiving it. Well, how people actually are resilient and recover from and stay really strong, healthy, and resilient in tough, tough times, civil unrest, wars, pandemics, you know, conspiracy theory, you know, conspiracy stuff going on all over the place that's being played out on us in the media and everywhere else. So how do we stay really strong? How do we overcome trauma if we aren't paying a therapist or getting medication because all those things will be cut off when we go into the deep tribulations. The medications and the trucks and the, all that stuff will be cut off. So, well, if you study history, how, how did the African American people you know, all through history, really, the, the um, African people, whether in Jamaica or anywhere, uh, how did they survive? How did the 
pioneers st survive. They survived, they would sing and they would make music together and they would dance together. That's how the wagons, the big wagon uh, gatherings did. They'd, you know, circle the wagons around and every night there'd be fiddling and dancing and singing. Mm. We heal in tribal connection through music. We do. So that's why I, I use the singing. That's why um, our circles are just as much about healing trauma as they are about teaching childbirth response. So I want to sing some songs on here every time so that, or at least one or two, so that people can learn them. And then you can have your own healing, you know, you can have your own circles or, you know, if people are suffering, you gather together and you sing and you all get healed. That's what happens. You don't have to go spend a hundred bucks an hour and take a bunch of harmful drugs to get better, which we're going to have to learn these simple tools because we're coming into times where we're going to need them. Anyway, I'm going to grab one of my drums and I've got the words to one of our songs, which a lot of people have liked. So I'll sing that one first. I mean, we, we sing a few nice songs and, and I also love children's songs. I think children's songs are really powerful and then the children can sing along and you know, it's nice. Okay, so let's get this music. Let's see. We're going to sing this song. Now, how did I learn these songs? <clears throat> these, this particular song is a song that um, we used to do blessing ways. Well, we still do them. We actually have done a few of them. And they've been amazing. We call, they call them blessing ways in the traditional Native American cultures that I was part of in Canada. And it, it just caught on with everybody and we were doing them. Basically, it's like a shower, but you don't just give her presents and talk. You honor the mother, you sing to her, you braid her hair, you do her feet, um, you give her little, you know, quotes of poems or it's just, it's a circle of love. We sing together, we heal together and we, we show her honor. We may give her a little bead and make like a necklace that she has at her birth or we all light candles and then we take them home and then we light them when she's in labor or there's special little things you can do where you make these little wrist um, wool wristbands and you weave together this circle of love for the mother okay so it really creates a lot of hope a lot of fortitude a lot of connection and a lot of I think super powerful um, preparation for a mother's birth to be safer and for her to feel more empoweredly sovereign in her own birth which makes a mother have a better outcome when she feels sovereign in her decisions and she feels empowered in her choices Okay, <clears throat> so what's this song called? It's called We Are Sisters on a Journey, and I learned it when I was doing a lot of these blessing ways, probably about 25 years ago in British Columbia. I'd like to write a book on that one, too. <laughs> All those experiences are really neat. <clears throat> I just got to clear my throat. <coughs> 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 We are sisters on a journey, what 
watching life unfold, sharing warmth of heart and hand, the knowledge of the old, the old, the knowledge of the old. Okay, that's all I'm going to sing for you today. I hope you have a really good day. Um, sorry for jiggling, but um, I'm really excited that I got to share this song with you today. And I know that the knowledge of the old is coming back. And I pray that I will be an instrument in the hands of God to share some of these really important pieces of wisdom with you. We've got our, um, mm, excited about this. I'm going to clip this little piece off before I look, put it to dry. I hope you have a very blessed and happy day. Go outside. See what's in your environment. I'm sure there's some wild crafting you could do for fun. Take care. Bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>